Welcome to another Stompy 51 miniature adventure. Today we're going to have a gamer's flip through the art of Paul Bonner out of the forests. Now, if you ever bought a White Dwarf magazine in the late 80s or 90s, you know exactly who Paul Bonner is because it was packed with his amazing artwork, which very much stood out. And he's still going strong, as you can see from his Facebook page, where I think he's probably posted at some point every single recent piece of art, but every single historical piece of art he's ever done. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't buy the book. Because at two fingers thick, it's an absolute treasure and a steal on Amazon for fifteen ninety nine in circumstances where that might get you half of the latest Warhammer 40k or Age of Sigma army book or codex, which you'll only have to replace in about a year anyway, whereas this will sit on your uh, coffee table forever and be an amazing resource. So, Out of the Forests by Paul Bonner. A nice solid hardback book. Festooned actually, in between the big set piece, coloured uh, works of art with these beautiful little sketches, pencil sketches, which no matter which part, how much or how little of the various creatures depicted just draws you in. And that is why Paul Bonner is obviously the man. Bit about how he got into all of it. As a kid, he watched, you know, Fantasia, all those movies that people like me would only have seen on Sunday reruns. Dracula, Frankenstein, One Million Years BC, Fantasia. El Cid, Spartacus, trips to the London Zoo, and you can actually tell in all of his art how there is a kind of fusion of the weird and fantastical with, well, basically elephants and rhinos, it seems to me, you know, real creatures. Went to art college, and then seems to pursue it for the rest of his life. Now, I don't know much about Rackham. It seemed to me that uh, confrontation was more of a French game and all I know about them is they basically just spend too much money on art and uh, kind of went uh, bust. But here are some of the pieces that he did for them, that Paul Bonner did for them. Happy little goblin with uh, a kind of witchy hat and, of course, the ever-present Odin's raven or Odin's budgie or whatever that is over there. I love that little kind of chin sock or whatever he's wearing, which is entertaining. And I love how it's something I've tried to bring out in my own orcs and goblins, but I've had more of it, more time and interest. But instead of everything just being green, he kind of melds different colours. You see, I'm not sure if that's just a a kind of lizard-like skin differential, you know, you know that kind of two-tone skin differential, so that. People from below kind of see sky and people from above see the ground, you know, which animals have to protect them. Or whether it's um, face paint. Oh, there's the whole picture. So again, you know, he kind of does a bit of a variegated pattern. So much of that kind of whitish tinge over there versus the orky green um, is paint or just skin colour. I mean, this is unbelievable. You do sometimes see miniatures kind of copying this uh, style of troll art because it's quite unusual, almost looks slightly Japanese. Oni, whatever they call their trolls. And again, the forest always screams out of any kind of Paul Barnett piece of art. Actually, this must be Japanese, look at that. I don't even know what the name of that is. But yeah, you don't often see a kind of samurai orc flying around. And you can get this as a miniature now. You can get it from Temple of the West. And Jerry at On Tabletop has done a lovely video uh, assembling it and really giving you an in-depth look at it. So go check that out.
You can see how much confrontation is obviously inspired. All the moonstone miniatures, that kind of mashing together of big, slightly crazed creature with small, um, slightly, you know, highly intelligent, possibly magical, possibly engineering crazed rider. Who doesn't love a wild and clever dude or dudette on a slightly dumb and entertaining beast? Crusty Balboa, love it. Though surely this one's inspired by Sir Didymus in Labyrinth with that film from the 80s. Or just go for your big and clunky attack troll. Some of his best drawings, I think, are the little dwarves that he does. They're not just standard Norse dwarves. They do look small and slightly deranged if they're evil or even quite steampunky and that's it's a shame no one has kind of taken this kind of approach up to be fair these look slightly war machine let's see if we can get this without the light no oh well nothing wrong with a bit of light on art i suppose a slightly ominous purple lizard and is it just me, or does that look slightly chitinous like the more modern gene stealers? Not only is it purple, but also, you know, it's got that spine-like armour plating. This looks quite cute, just this random floating... Oh, it's not floating. This little goblin wizard holding on to a branch with little bats sort of staring down at him and the night sky behind him, the gazillions of stars, which seem a bit closer than stars to us. That's the nature of the fantastical planet in question. Each picture telling a story. I'm not smart enough to work out what the story is. I think it's Dwarf Slayer looking to slay that creature. They're staring off at each other. It must be the seconds before. This rips him to shreds. I can't see how he's going to win out there. He must be coming to save his mate. Maybe they're coming to steal a treasure. Who knows? Very Terry Pratchett, whatever this is. Ragnarok. So, yes, yeah, so this is all confrontation. It's all confrontation. Yeah, these were some kind of like evil dwarves. Very characterful. These look kind of old hammer. And I do actually remember them from one of the confrontation books that I had, even though I never played. Something I swapped. More crazed evil dwarves. That same mishmash of crazy little dude on top of heavier dude. I think this was a miniature, a confrontation miniature, which I never had. And one thing I did like about confrontation was how, even though it was a kind of an early modern, um, late medieval kind of style, they still managed to make it pretty fantasy. So there's some monster who's actually wearing a full blown dead mammoth on his head creative, presumably heavy. I don't ever remember any pumpkin-headed men. And then there are these, which are kind of lost to time. But again, it's been uh, produced by Temple of the West. And Jerry at On Tabletop has done a lovely video of it. More orcs, more orc sketches, I played a bit of the Mewson Chronicles in the uh, in the 90s, they had some great Mark Cobbleston figures, I remember there was the 
kind of neo-British faction, which was quite fun. The ever-present, um, crazed, religious kind of faction, which you find in every single game, in War Machine, obviously Warhammer 40k, and which frankly, I suppose, mirrors the rise of religious fanaticism in our own world. But then again, I suppose, it's mirroring what happened, I suppose, in the 80s, when everyone here seems to have grown up. The British faction had a bunch of kind of crazed Celtic fringe maniacs with very heavy weaponry and gut-wrenching close combat equipment. Again, what's wrong with that? The Americans I always found slightly uninspiring. Capital, all of them fighting kind of the walking dead. Was it Algoroth? I can't remember the kind of the undead magical faction, the evil ones. My favourite, obviously, was the Germans, forward slash Central European faction. I mean, look at the character in that. They should have put two moons up there. It's always fun having a, a world with two moons. Isn't that a better tank than all the 40k ones? And also, whenever I look at kind of basing, I love doing this kind of stuff. Not that I'm actually up to it, but, you know. So you've got your main set piece person over there. And then you just, you know, add a bit of something to make it look like it's a battlefield in which people have fought. And to agitate the opponents, you kind of take the heads of whatever faction they play and put them on spikes on the base of your miniature. What's wrong with that? Oh, this was my favourite um, faction, actually, now that I remember it wasn't the Germans. It was the um, the kind of the, the evil corporation, bad science, bad medicine faction. And if someone did a decent miniature of him... I get that. I wasn't fussed by the Mishima, the Japanese faction. But again, look at that. Look at all the character in that. You imagine this crazed evil creature coming out to the depths of Venus or wherever this is, uh, which is this kind of Japanese space colony. And would anyone spend the cash on doing up a, a flying hover it like that, I suspect not. This must be for some kind of role-playing game or something. I don't remember ever seeing any of this or novels to do more with characters. The World War One style Brits. And is it just me or are we being hit by a, a wave in the last couple of years of weird World War I rule sets aimed presumably at trying to make an otherwise unplayable period because of the crazy scenery requirements with trench systems a bit more accessible. I even saw that one of the creators of um, Mordheim, Conrad's first name, Perinen was his surname, that he's uh, trying to work up launching a, another weird World War I kind of uh, setting. You know, I imagine these things all seem to have kind of you know, poisonous gas clouds that are kind of demonically possessed and tanks and everyone in kind of super armour looking either very German or strangely sci-fi British. Mishima over there again. The German faction on Venus fighting the evil ones. I remember reading on one of the, uh, on a forum once where uh, someone said, you know, look, everyone in wargaming with their kind of massed ranks starts sticking heads around, you know, looking for kind of ambush risk and how ridiculous it looks and, you know, shouldn't they all be facing forwards? But that's why I've never got into rank and flank games and I've always quite liked kind of fantasy games, sorry, uh, uh, science fiction games where you've got your uh, troops doing a kind of Vietnam marching, you know, furtively through the jungle with the, the birds, the avatar kind of creatures flying about and them kind of looking for risks which do occasionally pop up. And we all need more dinosaur riding heroes. I mean, he obviously thinks that he's toast. Fighting for his life there. I'm not 
not sure what racing game this is from. Does it explain? No, I don't think it does. But there's some cool painting inspiration if you uh, want to do any Gaslands painting. For the more modern factions on Mars. Not sure what that's all about. During my student years at Art College, every summer I went somewhere around Europe interrailing. Ah, the days when we were still part of the European Union. And he's, I mean, he's quite into kind of Nordic um, legends. The Kalevala, the, I suppose the Finnish national epic, which I've never really read. I guess it's on my bucket list. So lots of forests. And I've always liked this one, because who doesn't like dwarves? And it gives you a sense of their kind of size and scale. I've been listening to um, The Children of Ash and Elm, a kind of modern history of the Vikings. And it kind of explains that uh, you know, Scandinavia was full of forests. They couldn't really farm, not too many. I think 3% of Norway was farmable or something. But they had these huge forests and they felt so small. And they genuinely perceived that around them were all these scuttering creatures which now make up the world of Warhammer. And Trudvang and all these fantasy role-playing games. Which sounds ridiculous to us, but then again, we believe that, you know, that there are divine, the divine spirit encompasses our world, many of us. And, you know, we can't see the evidence of that necessarily. And neither could they, albeit, if you believe there are little creatures like this, should at some point you expect someone to have seen the creatures and this, you know, without being on mushrooms. Now this, I'm pretty sure was at the back of a white dwarf magazine. Maybe it's another one. This kind of Viking hall, Anglo-Saxon kind of hall, where the stranger who looks like it's popped out of the dark crystal has kind of come with a message to come talk to uh, the little dwarves. And I suppose it's quite redolent of, was it the Sami, the kind of the, the native Inuit type? people shows how much I know of uh, Scandinavia who lived kind of alongside but separate to the Vikings to this other creature that this, from another society has kind of popped over to these creatures the Viking Norse type dwarves with their highly decorated long haul I suppose they must have been de more decorated than we sort of see these days the ancient world must have had more color in it which it just hasn't survived archaeology Riot Minds. I'm not sure what Riot Minds is. Inspired by Norse mythology and Scandinavian folk tales. Ah, the fantasy world of Trudvang. Trudvang. Yeah, I think that's a role-playing game which I've never really got into. I can't really abide role-playing. I know it sounds strange because we're all just geeks, but I'm all about the kit bashing of miniatures, not imagining walking through the forests and bashing imagined creatures on the head. I like to imagine bashing a 10 inch high model on the head. Loads of little adventure types going about their business, meeting the denizens of the deep. And in the words of James T. Kirk, seeking out new life and blasting the living daylight out of it. It's always slightly terrifying how other lizards are to us and dragons. I mean, he just looks deeply creepy in a way that no mammal ever could. 
our games workshop. Somewhere deep within us all resides a well of sublime emotions which hark back to our ancestral roots and primitive origins. You do wonder if one reason why all this Warhammery Lord of the Rings stuff has taken off so fast is because it harks back to something primeval in all of us. I mean, if you listen to all these podcasts about, um, you know, the early hominids and humans, you know, they were, we didn't just kind of come out of nothing as homo sapiens. They were all antecedents of kind of creatures that I suppose split from, I, I'm going to embarrass myself here, you know, I understand that we and monkeys are cousins with a common ancestor, but basically there's a whole range of hominids before you get to homo sapiens, some of which survived at the same time as us, some of whom were bigger, some of whom were smaller. I don't know, Denisovans and Neanderthals, and so maybe all of this is just us remembering that. As I've mentioned in one of my other videos, here here he is making uh, Tolkien orcs with pirate hats a, a thing. Or Tolkien orcs with kind of World War II Stahlhelm biker helmets a thing. Goblins and wolves, got loads of those. And these I loved, these little sketches of characterful, charismatic orcs in the 90s, which even though Kev Adams did a lot of the orcs very well and was a Brian Nelson, notwithstanding that, the miniatures just couldn't keep up with this because of the casting and sculpting wars of the day. But, you know, this seems to live on in the sculpting eyes of people like Cromleck miniatures, whom I love. Spellcrow miniatures also kind of capture this to my mind. I mean, if you look at the Cromleck miniatures website, the orcs are clearly filling in the various gaps of the 40k codex. But actually, if you look more closely at the character, the comedy, and the kind of evil cunning of the various sculpts, they look a lot more Paul Bonner to me, more ni late 1980s, early 90s, than the kind of the modern approach. What do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, look at that. Guns and fungus. More comedy than Grimdark, I'd say. And if you look at the Spellcrow website, it's even more the case. I use these all the time because you can kind of make anything old hammer just by snipping off the head and putting on one of these. giving you a sense of a whole actual orc society with its kind of castes, its hierarchies, you know, its witch doctors, its actual doctors, tradespeople, the little thrall, goblin slaves at the bottom of the pile. The boss can't believe how childlike and stupid his slightly insane squabbling minions are. I do remember this piece of art very well. Apparently it had a a dead kind of Gretchen goblin lying there with this kind of orc boss staring at him, pondering the nature of war. And he was told by his superiors to kind of just get rid of it because it wasn't really, although they were grim dark, they weren't trying to do a kind of Vietnam War is pointless peace. And the miniature from that that's based on this is absolutely fantastic. And I'd love one. I had two and I can't believe I got rid of them. Um, but I think they go for like 30, 40 quid on eBay now. And they're never in a good state. Someone needs to kind of capture that and re redo it as an STL. Oh, Battlefleet Gothic, some kind of rogue trader. Orcs, orcs, orcs.
More orcs are the shock attack gun. The idea that these crazed little snotlings happily run into the back end of it and then get kind of sprayed through an alternative universe coming out somewhere else in our universe, slightly deranged, including coming out within kind of enemy terminators and exploding them from within. I always loved that. And I think that still survives as a motif. Yeah, you don't want that doctor anywhere near you. And this is must be Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, something which I've never really been into for the reasons described. I'm not even sure what this is. Fassa. Hmm. Not sure what that is. It looks like some kind of dwarves and trolls and goblins in a sci-fi setting. Not really familiar with it. <laughs> going to Australia. That's one thing I need to build a bit more into. Uh, maybe some of my miniatures. Aboriginal art. It's not too many games set in Australia, though. I mean, Eureka Miniatures, they're Australian. They do some great stuff. I'm not sure how much of it is actually Aussie by nature. Starship troopers just with giant lizards. And then there's a bit at the back with his dinosaur art. Which is the point at which I think we leave it for today. Thank you very much for watching to the end. Please do subscribe if you want to see what else is on my bookshelf. I've got a whole load of uh, Old Hammer stuff, which I can plough through. Um, it's fun for me to reopen these things and just go through them. And I hope it was fun for you. Keep well and keep safe.